every parent in here will be able to relate to what I'm getting ready to share and talk about. How many of you can remember days when you had those little ones in your arms and the fever would spike or there was something going on with that little one's life that was out of your control? It was out of the doctor's control. And you come to the end of yourself and the only thing you can say is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What peace, what peace and comfort will come just with that name, Jesus, Jesus. Every one of us have been in those times and those situations, relationally, illness, financial, name it. We've been there. When the prayers won't come out, the words won't come out, but the name Jesus, just something about that name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What a name. It's some kind of name because he's some kind of God, and we worship him and bless him. Lift your hearts again as we sing that one more time. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, say.
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for a wonderful time of worship and coming together and being in your house. Lord, I thank you for the sunshine on our back, but more than that, for the sun and the light you've given into our hearts. Lord, we pray today that uh, we'd be a blessing to your heart. We want this to be your worship service and your time together. We pray for Jeremy as he comes in a moment and uh, shares the word, and we pray that, Lord, you'd anoint him and refresh him and give great power unto his life. Lord, may the word of God transform our life as he shares it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and all the people said, amen and amen. You be seated and let's welcome our guest. If you're not a member of our church tonight, we want to welcome you with a special welcome. We're going to put a card and a packet in your hand that has information about our church. And I see a few guests around and so uh, the way we do that is we ask you to remain seated and uh, let's all stand up, turn around, welcome one another, and welcome our guest, all right? If you're not a member, you remain seated, please. Lift your voice, church. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your Down your life, that I would be. 
voice I sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. You may be seated. All right, take out your uh, bulletin and let's do our prayer time together. Let me bring you up to speed on some of these, and then I'm going to add some. Uh, you see down at the bottom, David Goodson, and that family has been here some. Summer Buchanan has been here. That's the granddaughter of Clara Melvin, and he passed on and went to the Lord on uh, Monday or Tuesday, I believe. What day was that? Yesterday. Yeah, we were there. Ray and I were there just previous to it happening. So anyway, we want to remember them, and then in the hospital... Don't forget Don Brown and uh, Tina Johnson. I'm going to tell you the ones that I know about. Tina had surgery today on the foot, and they found some more broken bones, found other things and uh, that they didn't know were there. And, you know, some of you have already asked me, how do they do that? I want to tell you, you know, they found places on me uh, for up to 18 months after my wreck that had gone wrong. And uh, because of bruising and all kinds of things, when you have a trauma accident, the x-rays don't pick everything up, even in all the modern science today. And I prepared her for that and said, Tina, that's probably going to happen. And, uh, but she didn't have as many injuries up and down the body that I had. But they did find that. And she had a pretty rough day today from uh, what I'm understanding. And then uh, Tony Watkins, I know about him. And we just need to keep, we need to keep praying for them. And uh, then Don Brown, did Don come home today? He's still there. Okay. They're trying to change the uh, antibiotic for him and help him on that and uh, get that foot healed up. But we need to pray and help that, ask God to just really intervene because he's had a hard, hard time uh, with that foot and all that injury. He dropped an air conditioner on his foot, what, six months ago at least? And uh, it split it and because he's diabetic and all, he's got this infection in, it's in the bone and so they're having a hard time. They've been treating him now for over six weeks. So uh, we, need to, we need to pray for him. Jerry Edmonds, and uh, he's actually better. I believe he's going to step down, hasn't hadn't he not? Okay, and I'm seeing uh, some of these. Nancy Moody, she had some tests run, but they came back uh, uh, normal. And she had a stress test done, and they just told her what you're having to deal with. And her mama is sick, and uh, an aunt is sick, and... Her brother is sick, and she's taking care of everybody, and it's just about to wear Nancy out. In fact, that's, she told me last time I saw her to tell you that's why she's not here. She's got so many people. They all live right out there, I guess, close to each other, and she is the main caregiver of everybody and taking care of them. Uh, and then Miss Beth, uh, Fritz a moment ago told me about her aunt, Shirley Griffin, 73, and she's just come up with cancer. They've started radiation immediately. Uh, her husband died, did you say, a year ago, about a year ago, and uh, she's still having to work full time, so uh, we need to remember her at 73 and just a lot of things going on. Uh, I told you a few weeks ago about a friend of ours, a dear, dear friend of ours, in fact, we talked to him last night, Jeff Morgan and Nancy Morgan. Jeff has come up with Lou Gehrig's disease. He's 53 years of age. It's already more serious than... Uh, it should be, especially for his age, and he's a great big tall man and, and a big husky man and been a healthy man, and he can't even do his yard work already. It's, it's, it's a fast-moving Lou Gehrig's, which is pretty unusual for how fast it's moving, so it's got them pretty upset. Then uh, I want you to write this name down. We, in fact, we're just going to have a special time of prayer for just a moment. Dr. Lee Ray Fowler, that is a long, long-term friend of ours, when my dad was 17 years of old age, he surrendered to preach under Dr. Fowler. Dr. Fowler is 93 years old and still preaching and doing interim pastorates all over Houston. That tells you where we're going. He lives on a three-acre uh, plot in southwest Houston. He's lived there for a long time in a beautiful home. He pastored an incredible church there. He's just been a unique man all of his life. And he is surrounded by water and trying to get some things out of his backyard. He fell and broke his arm, and they cannot get to him. And uh, they've got uh, power lines down and all kinds of things. And uh, so Miss Fowler called Mom and Dad about 4 o'clock today and said, Would you please pray? So I slipped upstairs and called him, and Lee Ray said he's in a lot of pain, but he's okay. And uh, it's a compound 
break. He says, I can see the bone coming through the edge. And at 93, they've got to get to him. And uh, they have called because they've got uh, cell phones and satellite, but they've got no electricity or anything where they are. And uh, the, he says the water, you can see it as far as the eye can see. It's not gotten in his house yet. So uh, anyway, and he is just a very, very precious, precious, precious man. He preached many revivals for Dad during my days of growing up. So his name is Dr. Lee Ray Fowler, and you just pray that they can get the uh, emergency people into that house somehow and get, get them out of there and taken care of. On top of that, I just think we need to pray for all of Houston right now. Uh, I know some of you don't realize it, but Houston is very, very much like New Orleans, not quite as bad, but it's a very low-level thing. They had over 18 inches of rain. They cannot handle that. The water has nowhere to go until it gets to the Gulf. And uh, the last count I heard, they had at least 1,500 homes uh, flooded, but uh, that doesn't count. All of downtown is flooded and up to the second floor in the downtown area, all kinds of damage going on, and it just brings all kinds of problems with it. And then uh, Ecuador, I think we need to remember Ecuador tonight, and that is a massive, massive uh, earthquake. And uh, as you know, the death count's going up on the hour, and it's probably going to continue, and they're still having uh, tremors uh, with that thing. You know, I read an article about it uh, just uh, yesterday or last night that all the seismographs in America, all but two, we're still shaking yesterday from the, from the earthquake that took place in Ecuador on Sunday. And so, you know, I mean, the earth is shaking right now is basically what they were saying. And, uh, uh, but that, that is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. So we need to remember them. Uh, Yogi said, and it's true, we, uh, we need rain. Everybody else in the country is getting too much, and we need some. And you need it here in a hurry. So he said, why don't you please tag on to that, that we pray for rain. Uh, I want us to pray about all these things, and then you uh, start praying about Dr. Vines. And on uh, uh, May, on Mother's Day, I need you to bring people. But more than that, I need you to ask the Lord God himself to come and be a part of this church on that day and give him the freedom to preach with great power and great strength. I keep telling you a lot about him. I was telling the, the staff about it, and I don't know that this will happen, but uh, I will promise you, he's one of those few preachers if he gets a hold of a sermon, you can hear him on one sermon. It can change your life forever. He's got six, and that's not every time I've heard him preach, but there's six or seven sermons I've heard him preach. I can just run them through my mind forever. And uh, I'm praying he gets a hold of one on, on our Sunday and that he's good and strong and, and here and he is looking forward to ministering. So you need to bring people that day. And don't forget that night. I need you to do your Mother's Day that afternoon and get back and bring your families that night. He does not preach very often on Sunday night anymore because of his age and because of his energy. I don't think he likes it being known, but he's got some health problems. And so uh, I'm doing my best to get him here two years because my prediction is you're not going to see Dr. Vines out on the road much more and get to hear him in person and feel the uh, power that he has. So those are the prayer requests tonight. And so let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer and uh, remember all of these requests and things of that nature. So let's gather up in twos and threes, all right? And uh, we'll pray together. And here in just a moment, I will close us.
Lord, we ask that you would take every single one of these requests and make them known to your heart. Lord, we pray for the emergencies right now. I pray for Dr. Fowler. But Lord, that the emergency people can get straight to him and get to him quickly. And Lord, that uh, you can ease the pain of the broken bone. And Lord, that you can take care of a man at his age and at any age. And Lord, we pray for David Goodson's family as they've said goodbye to him. And Lord, for Miss Griffin, we pray, Lord, that you give her peace of mind and heart and soul. As Lord, as she takes these treatments and is still working and all the things that's on her plate, I pray you give her the peace that passes understanding. Lord, I pray for Don Brown. I pray that, Lord, for him and Tina Johnson that are still in the hospital. And I pray, Lord, you give a sweet hand to their heart and to their soul. Lord, I pray for Nancy Moody and all the things that she's walking through and the things that she has. And then, Lord, tonight that many, many people that need prayer that have not even been mentioned, we ask that our church would have the heart to love them in every mind and soul. Lord, you know the mind, the body, the soul, the financial, the physical, the principal issues of everybody's life, the troubles, the difficulties, storms. I pray that, Lord, you put your hand of mercy upon them and you show people your great power and love. Use people in other people's lives to show the love of Christ to each other. Lord, I pray that uh, your strength would just continue to be poured out upon this church. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And all of our people said, amen and amen. All right, just before Jeremy comes, he's going to come and preach tonight. I believe it's out of Genesis, is that correct? You remember he's in an internship with Liberty. He's about to finish his master's, and he has to preach so many times. I went home and told Debbie, I said, man, the boy's got it. He can even eloquently welcome the guest. I thought he did an incredible job on Sunday morning. And uh, he's got a gift for this. Now, the very first time I ever heard him preach was down at the mission. And I said, that boy needs to be a preacher. So we've put a resume together. And Jeremy may not be with us forever because I'm fixing to put it out in some churches and write some letters. And uh, But the most thing you need to do is pray that God would open the door to the right place at the right time at the right moment, to the right church, where he needs to go, wherever he needs to go, anywhere in this world. Now, every preacher needs a good woman, so you just need to find him a good woman too, all right? <laughs> Got to have a preacher's wife, all right? All right, now, the last thing I keep forgetting, aren't you grateful for the ramp that's been built this week? It's already finished, it's done. I mean, we're not finished, but we're, we're there. It'll get carpet on it, and it'll get rails on it. And uh, they poured it today, and they said, you can walk on it tonight. It's going to be a lot better. It's up to code. I want to tell you a dream I have. I don't know if we can get it approved, but I would love to have an awning on it, somehow put a driveway out in that little spot, and have a place to pull our people underneath for when it's raining. We've got nowhere on this campus to pull people out of the weather and unload them into the church I've never had, honestly, I've never had a church like that. I don't know what it looked like, but I've got some folks already working on that. And uh, if it costs a bunch, we'll just take an offering. Amen. Come on, Jeremy. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, go to, with me to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, a very familiar story um, that most of us probably know kind of interesting that as I began to look at this, this passage, a lot of people uh, look at Genesis 22 and talk about the faith of Abraham. But there's a word that kind of sticks out to me in this passage, and I, I began to, uh, to look and come to find out it's the first mention of this word in Scripture. And so I believe it's significant uh, that we find the word worship in Genesis 22. And so I want to look tonight at Abraham's uh, journey through this uh, and what it has to teach us about worship. Um, a lot of times we, we get so focused on uh, music as worship and we get so focused on, on other things as worship and we lose, in a sense, the heart of worship. It's interesting that back in the 90s, um, there was a church over in England that the pastor began to feel this problem in his own congregation. And so he got with the uh, worship leader and they made a drastic decision. They took out all the music in their church because they wanted to make sure that they understood what the heart of worship was, that it wasn't just uh, the services, it wasn't just the music, 
Uh, they really wanted to understand what worship was. Their worship leader wrote some lyrics at the end of that time as they began to reintroduce music to their congregation. And he wrote these lyrics, which you're probably familiar with. He said, when the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Genesis chapter 22, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Beginning in verse 1, Scripture says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together and they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him upon the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for I know now that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went, took the ram, and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. As you're being seated, would you pray with me? Father, I pray that you will bless the reading of your word. God, I pray that in, in these next few moments that, God, you would speak, not me. That, God, you would uh, hide me behind the cross. That your, your voice would be known as we look to see what you have to teach us about worship. God, bless this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The word worship here is actually the Hebrew word shakal. It means to prostrate oneself or to humbly bow down. It's the first time, as I said, it's ever used in Scripture, and that makes it pretty significant. So what can Abraham teach us through this about worship? One commentator said it's, it's interesting that Abraham even called this all worship. The first thing I think Abraham teaches us about worship is that worship is obedience. Look back at verses 1 through 3. And these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. It's interesting because Abraham, from the very first time we meet him in Scripture, from the very first time Abraham encounters God, Abraham is obedient to the will of God. The first thing God says to Abraham is, leave your family. Go to a place that I'm going to show you. Abraham gets up and he does it. All through his life, most of the time, Abraham was obedient to God. And yet in this case, I kind of wonder if he didn't hesitate. Scripture doesn't tell us he did. I'm not a parent, so I can't officially, I can't, uh, uh, I can't imagine what it would be like for someone to tell you to take your child and to sacrifice them. But here is God who had given Abraham a promise and said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. 
He told him his descendants would be as the stars. And now he's asking him to take his son, his only son, his son whom Scripture says that Abraham loved, and to sacrifice him on an altar. And Abraham obeyed. What a testimony of a child of God to be able to say that I'm obedient to the will of the Lord no matter what. I heard the story of a tradesman who advertised for a boy to assist in his shop. A few hours after the morning paper had been circulated, uh, he was, his office was crowded with all kinds of boys, which made it very difficult because he didn't have any idea about which one to choose. So the next day he put a new ad out and said, wanted to assist in a shop, a boy who, obey, who obeys his mother. The response was quite different this time. He only had two show up. But what an incredible test, what an incredible testimony to be able to say, I am obedient to the will of God. Not just that I'm obedient, I am immediately obedient. It's very interesting and it's very important that we notice that Scripture says Abraham rose up early in the morning. He didn't delay. If you were here within the last couple of years when we had uh, life action, one of the things that was said over and over again in that revival summit was delayed obedience is disobedience. If Abraham had waited, he would have been disobedient to the will of God. It makes me think of the passage in Matthew 21 where Jesus is talking about a man who had two sons. He goes to the first and says, my son, go work in the vineyard today. And the son said, I don't want to. And later changed his mind and went. And he went to the other and said the same thing. And the son said, I will. And then didn't go. And Jesus looked at the crowd and said, which one did the will of his father? The one who just outright rejected the will or the one who delayed? We have to be obedient in all that God calls us to do, no matter what it is. Jim Elliott once said, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. When God issues you a command, when he issues you something to do, he's saying, go do it. Put everything you have into being obedient to the will of the Father. Sometimes it's not always easy. Sometimes we want, to, we want to run away and hide because we think, I can't do that. I don't have those skills. I don't have those abilities. I don't have that time. We want to delay or we want to just outright disobey and say, I can't do it. But it's interesting that uh, George, Mul George Mueller said, nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our heart's ready to do the will of God. When we're just willing to say, God, I'll do whatever you ask me. I'm willing. I'm, I'm here. I'm surrendered. I'm ready to worship. I'm ready to bow myself and humble myself before God and be obedient to whatever it is that he's asking. When we're in that state, it is usually but a little way to know the knowledge of what his will is. Abraham not only teaches us that worship is obedience, but I think Abraham also teaches us that worship requires preparation. All throughout this passage, if you look back in verse 3, it says that Abraham rose in the morning, took his donkey, his young men, he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose to the place that God had uh, directed him to go. Verse 6 says he took the wood of the offering, he gathered the utensils, and he went to go off to worship. It doesn't quite make sense to us because so often we think the, that worship is just coming into this building, that worship is just us singing praises to God, that worship is just the preaching of the word, and worship is yet so much more. Abraham knew that gathering those utensils for sacrifice was an act of worship. Are we prepared to worship? So often we come in here on Sundays and, and we think, okay, I'm, I'm prayed up, I'm, I'm ready to go. We're prepared to worship on Sundays. We're prepared to worship on Wednesdays, but are we prepared to worship through the week? We're only prepared to worship through the week, through every day of our life, if we truly understand that worship is more than just the services, it's more than the songs, it's more than the preaching. Worship is a lifestyle of saying, I am willing to submit myself to God, to humble myself before Him. Paul said in Romans 12, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God because this is your spiritual worship. We give everything 
that we have everything that we do in an act of worship. He went on to tell the Corinthians, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Worship is is not directed toward one another. It's directed toward Him. And ultimately, it's directed toward making His name known, to making Him glorified and magnified in all things. The story is told that the Italian poet Dante Alighieri was so deeply immersed in meditation during a church service that he failed to kneel at the appropriate time. His enemy saw this, ran to the bishop, and demanded that he be punished for his sacrilege. Dante responded, If those who accused me had had their eyes and their minds on God as I had, they too would have failed to notice the events around them, and they most certainly would not have noticed what I was doing. The question is, are we focused on Christ in our worship, or do we allow ourselves to be distracted? Since worship is a, a lifestyle, is something that I do on a daily basis because the way I talk to people, the way I act toward people on a regular basis reflects God, reflects His glory, and makes Him known either in a good way or a bad way. Therefore, it's worship when I magnify Him and I glorify Him. Do I focus myself every day to do that, or do I allow myself to get distracted? It's easy to be distracted. Our schedules are so full. There's so many things to do. We're running from here to there and back again. And we lose focus of what's really important. We lose focus of the fact that my life is about glorifying God. My life is worship. What I do to worship God. The third thing I think Abraham teaches us about worship is that worship is faith. Worship is being obedient to Christ. Worship is focusing on Christ. And then worship is trusting in Christ. Verse 7, the Bible says, And Isaac said to his father, My father, and Abraham said, Here I am. Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And they went off together. Abraham knew what God had asked him to do. And he willingly did it. Because he knew that no matter what happened, God was going to provide a way. He knew God was a faithful God. And he was willing to go and say, whatever you want, I'm here. I bow myself before you. I humble myself before the creator of the universe. Because I know that he's been faithful every step of the way. So I'll continue to do what he's asked me to do. It's also interesting that not only did Abraham know that God would make a way, but I can't help but imagine that not only did Abraham have faith in the situation, but Isaac had to have some faith too. Isaac went willingly too. We don't know exactly how old he was, but he probably was teenager, 20s maybe. Certainly old enough to to overtake his father who was well over 100 And yet Isaac willingly allowed himself to be placed on that altar, not knowing what in the world was going on, but saying, I trust my father because he trusts the Lord. Faith means I'll go wherever, I'll do whatever. It means I'll serve in the ministry where God has called me to. It means that I'll give where God has called me to give. It means that I'll be willing to carry the gospel to the world. I think about the faith of of spiritual giants, people who said, I will give my life in worship to honor God. I think about men like Jim Elliott and Nate Saint, missionaries to Ecuador who went to a people that they knew for almost for certain that they might not come out of it alive. And yet they willingly went because they believed that's where God had called them to go. They trusted the Lord. They worshiped with their lives. Their sacrifice of their lives actually made a way for the gospel to go into that very same village through their own families. George Mueller operated an orphanage in England, had such faith that he never once said, I need this to a person. He went into his prayer closet and he prayed to God and said, God, this is the need. You know what we need. Now you provide. 
And God provided every time. When we have that faith, it's amazing that, that God provides no matter what the situation. As we read on in the story of Abraham, we know that God provided the ram. God provided that way out because God said, I realize now that you trust me. I realize now that you will withhold nothing from me. So here you go. Here's a ram. We might not always experience deliverance in our faith, but we can trust that God is faithful to provide an answer no matter what. Sometimes his answer might be strength in the midst of the trial, but he always provides. Billy Graham said, faith isn't pretending our problems don't exist, nor is it simply blind optimism, but faith points us beyond our problems to the hope that we have in Christ. That hope is in Christ, and Christ is the object of my worship. What is the heart of worship? Matt Redmond put it so, so perfectly when he said, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about Jesus. No matter, uh, it's not all based on our obedience. It's not all based on our faith. It's based on us focusing on Christ and saying, I'm willing to surrender my life to Christ because he alone is worthy. Oswald Chambers said, faith never knows where it's being led, but loves and knows the one who is leading us. I read one writer this week commenting on the Matt Redmond song who said, the heart of worship is our heart, delighting in Jesus and expressing praise to him for the true things that scripture teaches us about who he is and what he has accomplished for us. It is then all about Jesus, not us. It involves us, but we're at the periphery. He's at the center. He's the focus. It's his commands we consider first, not our preferences. And so when Matt Redmond calls us in that song to come back to the heart of worship, it's about coming back and refocusing and recentering our lives and reminding ourselves why we worship and who we worship. We worship a God who has been faithful. We worship a God that we, that we realize has given so much for us. I was reading a commentary just this afternoon on that passage over in Romans 12 where it says, this is your act of reasonable worship. And it was interesting because the commentator said it's reasonable because we realize what God has given to us. We realize the sacrifice he has made for us. We realize that he has gone beyond what we could ever deserve. Therefore, our worship is just a fraction of that. We could never give back all that he's given to us. And yet, we worship him. We worship him out of love. We give our lives. The question I have for you tonight is, are you at the heart of worship? Is your worship focused on Christ? Not just when you come in this building. When you walk out that building. When you go to work tomorrow. When you enjoy your leisure time, is your life focused on Christ and saying, I'm giving my life as an act of worship. I'm giving my life to make him known, to glorify him in all that I do. For an unbeliever, it's impossible because you, you worship idols until you come to that moment of faith and repentance and say, God, I submit all to you. I surrender all all to you. But for us as believers, to be at the heart of worship means we reflect the glory of God in all that we do and all that we say because we're obedient to Christ, because we're focused on Him, because we trust Him. So tonight, I don't know where you're at. I don't know where your worship is at. But maybe, just maybe, we need to refocus, recenter ourselves, and come back to the heart of worship, recognizing that everything we do is an act of worship, and that Christ alone 
is worthy of all of that because of all that he's done for us and so much more. Would you pray with me? Father, God, we could never repay you for all that you've done for us. You've given us so much. God, the, the gift of grace is we don't deserve. And yet because of your gift, because of your love, we just come to worship you. We come to lay our lives down no matter what that looks like. We'll be obedient. We'll surrender ourselves. God, we'll, we will humbly bow before you with our lives acknowledging that you are, are our Lord and you alone are worthy. Father, I pray that you would take this time of invitation. God, that you would use it to transform hearts and lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This altar's open. You need to pray. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior. I invite you to come. Brother Ray will be here at the front. Maybe you're a believer that just needs to refocus on the heart of worship tonight. The altar's open. As Miss Angela and they play, just be obedient to the Spirit of God tonight. time to give joyfully. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of coming back to your house tonight, dear Lord. I thank you for the message that we heard from Jamie, dear Lord. I pray that you would just take that message, Lord. Help us to apply it to our lives, dear Lord. I pray for your blessings upon him, dear Lord. I pray for your leadership, your guidance in his life, dear Lord, in these upcoming days, dear Lord. I pray for Tennessee Avenue, Lord. You just continue to keep your hand upon us, Lord. I pray for your leadership and your guidance in each one of our lives, Lord. I love you and I praise you. In Christ's name, I humbly pray. Amen.